In just a moment, lawyer, political commentator, and best-selling author Miss Ann Coulter will be joining us to try to get a handle on how a country founded on religious freedom should respond to the declaration of a religious war and how this affects immigration reform. We'll also get Coulter's take on the upcoming presidential election. But before Ms. Coulter joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about her background. Anne Hart Coulter was born in New York City and grew up in New Canaan, Connecticut. She received her undergraduate degree from Cornell University and her law degree from the University of Michigan. Her first foray into politics was as a law clerk for Pasco Bowman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. For a short time, she worked as a lawyer in New York City before signing on with the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee. She worked on crime and immigration issues for Senator Spencer Abraham of Michigan. And later, Coulter became a litigator for the Center for Individual Rights. By 1996, she was ready for prime time. She served as a legal correspondent for MSNBC, and shortly thereafter began her syndicated column, which appears in newspapers, websites, and periodicals all across the country. Coulter has been a frequent guest on Fox News, CNN, The Rush Limbaugh Show, Bill Maher, just about every popular news program you can name. And wherever she goes, she is not shy about telling it like she sees it. And I would be remiss if I did not mention Miss Coulter has authored 11 best-selling books and maintains a public speaking schedule that put most public personalities to shame. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report lawyer, columnist, and political commentator, Miss Ann Coulter. Thank you for joining us, Miss Coulter. Thank you for having me. Well, I'll tell you, you are burning up the Twitter sphere. <laughs> I know, and it was after quite a long break through... Uh... Christmas and New Year's, I had about a dozen guests for three weeks. My my uh, Facebook friend was was emailing saying, "Is something wrong with you? You haven't been tweeting." Um, <laughs> but, but in the past day or so, he said, "Well, I guess you're back." <laughs> oh yeah, well, uh, a lot of people found you, and uh, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. You know, it's no secret you have whipped up quite a bit of dust on the immigration issue in particular, and. For a while now, you've been advocating that we pause immigration for people of the Muslim faith, something GOP candidate Donald Trump is now advocating. So tell us a little bit about how that would work. Um, Well, actually, I recommend a a complete across-the-board pause, which isn't as radical as as, uh, many, many, basically the rest of my political party, other than Donald Trump and the entire Democratic Party, um, would have you think that Calvin Coolidge put in a half century moratorium on immigration, um, and for a lot of the same reasons, but much worse now, we need time to assimilate the ones already here. The the the, the um, culture of our country, the the fabric of our country, is being changed. This is all described in in my latest book, Adios America: The Left's Plan to Turn Our Country into a Third World Hellhole. Um, for for the Democrats, they at least have a specific plan in mind, replace American voters with new voters more inclined to vote for left-wing policies. Um, the Republicans are just wandering around like Elmer Fudd, um, seem to have no idea that the entire country is about to come, become California, I mean, without the beautiful beaches and lovely people. Um, it would just be, you know, Democrat after Democrat after Democrat. We'll have the Chuck Schumer Democratic Party running against the Nancy Pelosi Democratic Party. Um, so for purely reasons of political survival, it's been a little baffling watching the Republican Party behave this way. Um, but beyond that, even if you're not a Republican, um, the culture is changing. There is an American culture. Um, we are not a nation of immigrants. We're a, we're a nation that began as a British colony and remained heavily British Germanic and obviously 10% East, uh, roughly 10% East African for the first 200 years of its existence. We're less a nation of immigrants than, than most countries are. But the last 50 years since Teddy Kennedy's 1965 Immigration Act, there has been a radical transformation. And, you know, the rich people don't see it. It's not, it's not a hitting Park Avenue or Knob Hill, but town after town is seeing 
um, people from very different cultures, um, much more misogynistic cultures, were being introduced to child rape, gang rape, honor killings, clitorectomies, um, things that America has never has never faced before. Uh, a lot of these, you know, the, the government scams, the Medicare frauds, the Medicaid scams, the food stamp scams. Um, I have one page in Adios America. I was trying to figure out how to illustrate. This isn't a Native American habit. Our criminals, we think of criminals as dumb people um, who do dumb stuff like hold up liquor stores and there are cameras all over them, um, you know, kill his wife for the insurance money while dropping his DNA all over. Oh, no, no, no. We are bringing in cultures where every level of society is criminal. We have really smart criminals now stealing billions of dollars from the Social Security Fund, that Medicare fund. And anyway, the way I came up with, I, I wanted to write the book, you know, Quickly, simply, it's shorter than it looks. There are about 100 pages of footnotes, um, so you can read it, and I think it's, I think it's a fun book to read. Um, but the way I, I chose to illustrate it, I was running various Nexus searches, and finally I just broke it down to one month, November 2014. That's when I happened to be doing that, that toward the end of the book, that particular chapter. Um, and I just put in the words, I forget what it is, but it's footnoted so you know exactly what the search is, something like Medicare, Medicaid, ins- and insurance fraud, and, and limited all Nexus documents to that one month. And I just ran a list of the names. Mm-hmm. Just ran a list of the names. <laughs> billions and billions of dollars from manifest, manifestly recent immigrants, Im- Im- immigrant names. Right. Well, I just want to get back and clarify the fact that you'd like to see a pause in all immigration until we get an immigration policy in place. Right. All, so all immigration. You're, exactly. not, you're not singling out Mexicans. You're not singling out Muslims. You're just saying that we don't have an appropriate plan that protects America in place. And when we do, we can decide how that immigration should work. Is that, is that, do I have yeah, that right? That's right. And also... Okay, but so much is, you know, when you yeah. say something, you know this better than I do. Your words get twisted 11 ways from Sunday. Um, yes, that's why I like live interviews like this, and I thank you for that. But it's not, it's also to assimilate the ones already here. I mean, the, the immigrants have changed, and which is why I'm always telling people I do not want to hear any weeping about your ancestors at Ellis Island. Pre-1970 immigrants, we weren't a welfare state. I mean, we got Teddy Kennedy's Immigration, immigration Act drastically altering who would be coming to this country at the same time as we got the Great Society programs um, and turned America into huge welfare states. So for one thing, pre-1970 immigrants, 30% of them went home. They couldn't make it in America. This is how we ended up with the creme de la creme from around the world, as any sane immigration policy would require. I mean, immigration is just a government policy like any other. Why shouldn't we look out across the world? And, you know, we're, we're the New England patriots. We, everybody try out. We'll take the top five. That's how our immigration policy should work. So for one thing, to get the immigration policy in order, but also we've become so politically correct, um, and instead of... Um, a 200-year tradition of assimilating immigrants to the American way of life, to the middle-class way of life, to the respect for women and children and not littering and not stealing way of life. No, now it's a hate crime to ask immigrants to assimilate to our massively successful society. No, instead, we're supposed to assimilate to their unsuccessful societies. So, for one thing, we we have to do some changes here at home, too, in order to assimilate the immigrants coming in. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think what you're that. saying is is that uh, we have bent too far the other way to accommodate diversity and culture, and uh, maybe we just need to uh, look at a correction. Now, uh, we have to take our first break, but stay right, right where you are. We'll be right back with more from Ann Coulter. You're listening to the Costa Report. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is lawyer, author, and political commentator Ann Coulter. And before the break, you were saying that rather than assist immigrants to assimilate into the American culture, our overriding policy seems to have been to allow immigrants from other countries to shape our culture, and that we've gone too far in many practices that we now accommodate. And and uh, and we've also made it easy for immigrants who do not contribute in a positive way uh, to American life to remain here. Is that right? 
Yes, yes. Um, there was, I quote, a, um, a Clinton administration official um, saying, and this is how long it's been going on. I mean, it's really gone into overdrive the past couple of decades, um, though it's been happening pretty much since 1970. Uh, Clinton administration official saying something to the effect, this is a rough paraphrase, but it's, it's a good paraphrase. Um, we have left the time when we will ask immigrants to assimilate to our culture. The time has come for um, white American culture to do a little assimilating to these other cultures. Well, why would you do that? We have a massively successful culture. It's unique in the world. There is nothing like America. And we are really talking about, at this point, a, a genuine existential threat to this country. If America is gone, it's not just lights out for Americans. It's lights out for the rest of the world. This is a powerful Christian country. I would say it is the only genuine Christian country. I mean, there may be some little, some little ones here and there. Um, but the only country with any power that is a genuinely shot through with Christianity from its very founding country on earth. When this country is gone, who is going to save these other countries from warlords, from tsunamis, from, from, from Ebola, from, from, from the Nazis? Um, well, let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk mm -hmm. about the most powerful Christian country on the earth. Uh, a lot of people, and I include myself in this, are stumped as to how to respond to what terrorists have now framed as a religious war when our country stands for religious freedom. Help me understand, how do we fight a war without making religion part of it, or can we? Um, that's a good question. I would, I would think the very minimum first step is stop inviting people in who hate us and hate our culture and may commit terrorism. We'll start with that, and then we can work out the details on um, you know, the rhetoric of how we do this. But I, I, I mean, but the minute is, we do that, we're talking about people whose common denominator happens to be a religion. And, um, and that, 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 that's really shaky ground, as you know. See, I don't, I don't think so. I think uh, this is a Christian country. Other religions are free to practice here, but when you get a, this idea that, as I think Nikki Haley said in her, her speech the other night, I know I've heard, I've heard others saying it, that, yeah. oh, I know, it was the Muslims that the Democrats were inviting to the State of the Union address to show how important Muslims are to, to our country. Look, there are plenty of lovely Muslims in this country um, who, are, who are fantastic Americans. I happen to be friends with one of them. Um, but... Uh, the idea that this country was built, you know, it was begun as, let's have a country where all religions can come in and we'll take a little bit from the Koran and, you know, a little bit from Buddha. No, this was not only founded by Christians, it was founded by Protestants. I but, mean, clearly our the laws, but, but clearly our laws were constructed not to treat that's, people of different religions differently. That's part of Protestantism, that it's got to be chosen by free will. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the animating influence underneath it isn't distinctly Christian. I mean, George... Um, King George used to refer to the American Revolution as that Presbyterian War. Um, Edmund Burke praised the American Revolution, um, as you will know if you are, were a, clo are a clo close, close reader of Ann Coulter. Um, mm -hmm. Edmund Burke also denounced the French Revolution, which is where I set the beginning of liberalism and conservatism. Conservatism is, is the American Revolution, liberalism from you know, Mao to Stalin, that's the French Revolution. Edmund Burke, although he was British, was supportive of, supportive of the American Revolution. And his two reasons for that were, number one, they were Englishmen. Number two, they were Protestants. And because of their Protestantism, um, he said something to the effect of it is the particular brand of, of Protestantism that is the most resistant to, to any captivity of, of the mind or soul, that, it, that insists upon freedom and free will. So it is actually part of the Protestantism of the founders that created a world where, yes, people can come here with uh, other religions, and they aren't going to be persecuted, um, and they can live their lives, lives freely. But we have to understand that the underlying animating philosophy to this country and to our founding 
is is a Christian worldview. But even and so, we more, didn't limit it to Christianity. We we you know it it may have been the religion of the founding fathers and and formed the foundation. But even so, we've always had and embraced people's differences in beliefs. That's that's um, one of the beauties of our point. country. Um, I would disagree with that. There comes a point where the n- numbers make a difference. I mean, there's a reason the main immigration, anti-immigration group in the country um, isn't called, you know, go Christians or, <laughs> or um, no Muslims. What it's called is Numbers USA. There comes a point when these other cultures... And we are certainly seeing that now. And I think a lot of your listeners will recognize what I'm talking about. When you have so many Somalis, um, as estimated, and it's all in a footnote in my book, about 100,000 in Minnesota, when they move into Minnesota, I mean, there isn't even, there isn't any possibility of assimilation besides the fact that it's considered a hate crime. No, we have large groups of immigrants from very different cultures coming to America and creating their own little ghettos where they don't have to learn the language. They can speak their own language. They keep their own customs. Um, I think it's, there have been various polls, and my numbers may be slightly off, but not enormously. There's something like 50% of American Muslims, say, um, you know, when, when polled, yes, I think it would be great if we lived under Sharia law. Mm-hmm. Um, there comes a point where the numbers overwhelm what is the, the fabric of the nation, and it is the Christian fabric that not only allows every, you know, Buddhist and Muslims to live freely and, and comfortable, wonderful lives with wonderful, nice Christians, but women, but children, right. but gays. All so if I if I hear you right, the same the yeah. same freedom, the same safety in right. any other country, and that's not an accident. Well, what I hear you saying is it's two things: it's the absence of assimilation or the requirement to assimilate, but you're also concerned about critical mass, yes. being developed. Yes, yes, yes. And and, and it, it's interesting getting... that I talk about this a lot on this program. That if you want social change, you want the end of the Vietnam War, you want uh, civil rights, uh, those things could not come about without critical mass. You can't have an ecology movement without critical mass. But sometimes critical mass happens as an unintended consequence. And when it does, people don't recognize the change underway. I think that's what you're saying. Exactly right. Although clearly some people are recognizing it. Thus... The rise of Donald Trump. Um, I mean, these, and I, as, again, it's not Knob Hill, it's not Park Avenue, it's not Beverly Hills, um, but a lot of American communities, are, you know, have suddenly gone um, all Mexican, all Somali. Um, right. That that isn't America anymore, <laughs> and there will be changes that we're not used to. That that's correct, and that's a natural repercussion of critical mass. We have to take another short break. Stay right where you are. Uh, we're going to come back and talk about whether it's a good idea to bring back literacy tests for voters. So stay tuned. You're listening to the Costa Report. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is Ann Coulter. And we've been talking about the need for immigrants to assimilate to the culture and the consequences when the critical mass grows to a point where the very fiber of American culture is altered in ways which are inconsistent with American history or values. And uh, speaking of assimilation, I think last year, I think I think it was last year, you proposed this idea of literacy tests for voters, and that created a bit of a backlash. Uh, I think you said think something like 124 one. languages of ballots are available now in the oh, U.S. Yeah. or something. Yeah, no, I mean, consider that. There are, there are these poor, you know, little little towns have to print up um, ballots in a hundred different languages. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't think they're going to be discussing, um, you know, bills on the Senate floor in Urdu. So why are people allowed to be voting in Urdu? Um, and, you know, as for the assimilation thing, um, this is this our, our actual immigration history is shot through with that concern with, um, for example, a concern that too many Germans were coming in. And that is, look, Germans are, are some of our most fabulous immigrants and, you know, hardworking and, and incredibly successful. But but even early in the country's history, the, the the original colonists had to put their foot down and say, no, we don't want to be a German colony. We don't want that to be the culture. There is a very distinctive British Protestant culture. Um, another example of this um, 
which I think is interesting. Um, I, I'm, I'm a quarter Catholic, um, Irish Catholic. That's where I got my taste for liquor. Um, but <laughs> the, the Irish Catholics, or Catholics generally in this country, are not like, um, though they were not accepted in colonial days. Uh, Jews could vote in, in mo- most of the colonies before Catholics could, and the reason for that was um, the, the colonists were concerned that um, Catholics would have uh, um, they'd be too deferential to this foreign power. They were under, they, they would defer to the Pope on things. And that was a big thing, obviously, in, in revolutionary times. We didn't want any foreign powers getting involved. And as Samuel Huntington, the Harvard professor, has written, Catholics didn't become fully accepted in American society until they became more American Catholic and less Roman Catholic. And you see it today in the difference, for example, in Catholics in America versus Catholics throughout Latin America. Part of the, what, what a lot of scholars look at, and by the way, this isn't the theme of my book. I'm just chit-chatting about things that interest me. Right. Uh, there have been all these studies of what makes a country honest. You can, you can look up probably right now on Google, you know, what are the most honest countries? And obviously that's important for the running of governments, for the running of businesses. Um, and what they've concluded, the two most important factors, UCLA and Harvard professors, lots of studies and papers on this. Two most important factors in the honesty of a country is, number one, Protestantism. Number two, years of British rule. Um, And to get back to the Catholic point, um, part of what you see in Latin America, the the Protestantism in particular that's come out in these cultural studies, is that, and we saw this a lot with this current pope, who is very unlike other popes, but he goes back to um, the bad cultural influences of Catholicism, and that is this idea that poverty is by itself a sign of virtue, and wealth is by itself. That is a sign of you, you must have gotten that ill-gotten gains. Well, American Catholics don't have that at all. Um, and in fact, I, I don't know if it's true today, but I know at various times you know, in the last decade or so, Catholics have been the highest earning Americans. Um, I mean, you can think of a, of a bunch of them off the top of your head. Um, but, 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 but you, do, you certainly see it with this current pope that you know, we have to worship the pope. Well, you're poverty-stricken. You, have, you can't support your family. You must be good. That is so not a part of, of Protestantism. Um, you know, we have the, 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 you know, the famous Protestant work ethic, which is what you see with American Catholics. Well, uh, my mother was Japanese. A lot of people don't know that because I, I just don't look Japanese <laughs> at all. I bet you have beautiful hair. Uh, I do have thick hair from my mom. <laughs> it's one of the wonderful genetic uh, inheritances that I did get. But I but I got a whole list of other things, too. Um, uh, but it was interesting because when I watched the assimilation of the Japanese after World War II, there is a classic case of a uh, community who wanted to assimilate under the worst of circumstances, yes. even having been in internment camps, yes. uh, my mother would not allow one piece of trash on our street. Uh, yes. She, yes. Our yard was immaculate. Our house was immaculate. She really felt like she wanted Americans to respect our family. Yes. And, uh, yes. And, and she knew that the way they would respect them was how her kids wore clean clothes and got good grades. And, you know, we had, boy, uh, Lord help me if I came back with a B on a book report. <laughs> you know, uh, it was sit at the kitchen table and yes. do homework that she came up with, not my teachers. Um, and, and I thank her for that. But if you look at the Japanese community, think of where they were. I know. Stripped of their rights. And now you have... And, and I, I have never forsaken the Japanese culture. That culture is alive in our family. Uh, right. But but no one would argue as to whether uh, the Japanese fully assimilated in such a short period of time. Yes, that's right. And and do we take, I, I mean, if we take 20 Japanese immigrants a year at this point, I'd be shocked. All of, you know, like I say, big difference in pre-1970 immigrant and post-1970 immigrants, and, um, you know, you know to, par- to paraphrase Donald Trump, and I'm sure some of them are good people, um, about 20% are good people, but other than that, and this gets back to the crucial, to the heart of my book, 80% of post-1970 immigrants are voting for the Democrats. 
That's why they want them, and they don't care how American culture changes. They never particularly liked America to begin with. They would love to turn us into, into a completely different country to punish America for being successful. Well, the country that immigrants moved to and went to a lot of trouble to move to and the country that was built by, by generation after generation of Americans isn't going to exist anymore if we don't stop this constant importation of new people um, that really is changing the culture of our country. Well, I got a couple of minutes here before I got to go to break, and uh, you kind of opened the door to this. I'm always amazed that Donald Trump seems to say many of the same things you've been saying this last year, but when he says them, they're entertaining, and when you say them, they go after you with, uh, you know, with knives and forks. Well, I what, what, what is that? What what is going on here? Because I I'm, I don't get it. Like I I could almost take quotes that you have and put them side by side with Donald Trump, and everybody seems to stand up and applaud and cheer. And then Ann Coulter says it, and it's like, oh, she's just a hater. No, what, what I is think it? Going after Donald Trump in exactly the same way. I don't have not to as viciously. President. Let me be the first to say they don't uh, listen. You don't hear what they say behind your back. You only hear what they say on the media. <laughs> I, uh, uh, they don't go after him like they go after you. What? I think they do, but he has the people behind him. I've been begging some presidential candidate, in fact, without naming names, not that it was completely off the record, but just to be polite. I had private audiences with three Republicans running for president, I begged them to take this immigration issue. Yep. I wrote it out. I had long conversations. No, they didn't do it. They still won't do it. Donald Trump saw me on the Jorge Ramos show a week before my book came out and instantly, you know, asked for an advanced copy of the book. He has been on this issue. He has been pro-American and and I think it is like me. I mean, despite the hatred of uh, from the media, um, I've been pretty popular with book buyers and and TV viewers and radio listeners. The only problem I I have is that that what has been uh, perpetrated in the media is that you want a a, uh, immigration policy against Muslims. You want an immigration policy against Mexicans, that you're singling a religion out. You're singling a nationality out. What I wanted to do, and I think it's been done uh, on this program, is to say that we don't have a sensible immigration policy. There is nothing wrong with pausing all immigration across the board, which is what you have said and I feel has been mischaracterized. And I'm, that's why I wanted to have you on the program, because, look, I don't agree with everything you say, but it's not coming from a crazy place. It's coming from it's coming from actual data and it's a legitimate position. I don't have to agree with everything you say to respect that. Now, we got to take our final break, but we will be right back after we hear from these important sponsors. I hope you'll take a moment to listen to their messages. You're listening to the Costa Report. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Ann Coulter, and we've been talking about immigration today. And uh, as we ended the segment, you mentioned that you begged the Republican leadership to take on this issue of immigration, and uh, they really didn't until uh, Trump did. Yes, and one thing you'll notice generally, um, or at least I've noticed in the media world I'm in, um, and part of what I think Reagan's, what was so great about Reagan was the GE tours. It is so important to get out and meet Americans. And I've noticed that generally, and I think you see this with the immigration issue, um, radio hosts are more in touch with the public than TV hosts are, because if nothing else, they're taking calls. Um, and often they're out mingling with and doing radio events. And, you know, what, that's, that's what I do for a living. I write books, write my column, and I give speeches. Um, and, and I've known this has been a huge issue for such a long time, such a long time. But the only one who is, who is willing to take it up um, has been Donald Trump, which is why um, – one of the one of the early tweets I sent out when he um, at back when he put out his first um, policy paper, which was the immigration policy paper, and it is the greatest political document since the Magna Carta. I recommend you go on and just you know type it in Google and look it up. It's about a page and a half, and every line is pitch perfect. It is brilliant. It's fabulous. So 
woke up Saturday morning, read it, and started sending out a flurry of tweets when it came out. This is many months ago. And I tweeted, um, I don't care if, if Donald Trump performs abortions in the White House as long as he keeps this immigration policy. Um, the point of that is, is for one thing, hyperbole. I won't. I'm, I love this interview, and thank you so much for doing it without constantly asking, is that a joke? Is that a joke? Um, yes, it's hyperbole, <laughs> but it makes a point. Yeah, but you do is- have a sarcastic. You've got a sarcastic streak, and people don't no, necessarily. No, it's a catchy line. Yeah, they, they don't. They don't get it. You know, no, uh, you're not. You're not making. It's not a joke, uh, but right, you're just making the point, the point in, a, in, a, in an entertaining way. But it is an important hyperbole because how is it exactly Republicans plan to overturn Roe v. Wade if they can never win another presidential election, and if immigration policy continues the way it has been going for the past thirty years? Um, it, all of the country becomes California. Republicans never win another presidential election. So how are you going to overturn Roe v. Wade then, Republicans? What's your plan? Um, it makes an important point, and, and that is why everything, whatever issue you think is the most important issue, I submit you are wrong. You give me the issue, and I'll tell you why it's de- determined by immigration. I mean, look at Obamacare. Why do we have Obamacare? Well, for one thing, Obama never would have been elected but for the last 30 years of immigration. Romney won, um, he certainly wouldn't have had more than one term, Romney won more of the white vote than Ronald Reagan did in 1980 against Jimmy Carter. Um, If you won that much of the white vote, that used to mean you you won. Well, the white vote has been pushed down so much in America that Democrats can't win the white vote. They haven't won the white vote since 1948. Um, So they decided, okay, screw it, America. You won't vote for us? We're bringing in ringers. We tried this the easy way. Um, Not only would you not have had Obama to push Obamacare, Al Franken never could have been elected without 100,000 Somalis in Minnesota. Uh, you'll remember um, he stole that election, but it wouldn't have been close enough for him to steal without 100,000 Somalis in Minnesota block voting for the Democrats. So this is why I say Republicans are whistling past the graveyard if they're going to go around and tell us about their little plans for how they're going to fix you know, Social Security or the Exim Bank or how they're going to replace Obamacare or how they're going to overrule Roe v. Wade. It's not going to happen in a country that continues our current immigration plan. Well, let's talk about that. Let's, let's switch gears for a moment and talk about how this election is shaping up. Uh, everyone in the media expected Donald Trump to bottle rocket, but he, and he's not only maintained it, maintained his lead, but he's also increased it. So, and I know we've got a long ways to go, but how do you see things shaping up for him? Well, as it, as you say, and I suppose I should always say this instead of just bursting out with my predictions. Of course, it's true. Anything can happen. I'm making prediction about the future. Yet and still, as of week two, after. Donald Trump announced he was running for president. I have said he's going to be the nominee and he's going to be the next president. Um, he is doing, he is running exactly the campaign Republicans have needed to run and refused to run for politically correct reasons, which is idiotic. As I, as I mentioned at some point in this interview, I, for some reason, immigrants to America chose to come to America. They didn't go to Honduras or Bangladesh or Mexico or Syria. They wanted to live in America. <laughs> Americans want to live in America. Why do we have to change our country? Well, We're not I'm helping the immigrants. I, I am a sociobiologist, and you know, I I often tell my children, "We want what we want, uh, and it's not always rational." <laughs> You know, there was a famous philosopher that once said, uh, man is the uh, is the organism or the animal. I don't remember the exact quote is the animal that is rational. And I thought, oh, so close, so close. What he should have said was man is the animal that rationalizes. (laughs) That is a fantastic point. (laughs) So, you know, I mean, you know, we want what we want. And sometimes we think, well, I'm going to go to America to have a better life. But when we get here, we say, but, you know, I'd like America to accommodate my previous life that I just escaped to come here for. I, I I, I understand how irrational that sounds, but we are not a rational organism. And uh, (laughs) and that and, and that is one of the plights of uh, humankind at this particular point in our in our development. Uh, so let me ask you about the the Saunders Clinton race right now. It looks like uh, Saunders has pulled ahead in New Hampshire, a couple of other states. How, how what do you make of that? 
Um, well, I, I right before calling into you, I I emailed my friend Matt Drudge saying, Matt Drudge, if you prevent Hillary from getting the nomination, I am going to be so mad at you. Oh, <laughs> um, because I've been I'm I'm. I'm a political junkie. I've been listening to a lot of these, um, the stump speeches, the rallies of all the presidential candidates on C-SPAN over the past few weeks. Yep. Um, and, oh, my gosh, Hillary is an awful speaker. I, it's amazing she's been in politics this long, and you see her speaking, and all I can think is, does she know she's standing in front of a microphone? She doesn't need to yell. Yeah, <laughs> she, yeah. she is the wor- most awful public speaker. Well, thankfully, most- we don't elect on the basis of whether you're a good speaker or not. Hopefully, we don't. Well, except with her, it's more than I. Th- I it is important. Uh, she is she's hectoring, and a lot of cliches. And I just I want her to be the nominee. And I mean, either one. I think Trump Trump is going to win. He's he's finally raised an issue. Repub- or the American people forget Republicans. The American people have been begging some candidate to raise for twenty years now. Um, but I do think it would be fun to have Trump run against Hillary. So. Well, well the debates would certainly be interesting, wouldn't they? <laughs> yes. Well, we're about I think we could se- I think they tonight. could sell tickets and pay off their campaigns. That is the only <laughs> reason anyone is watching the Republican debates. I was at the last Republican <laughs> debate in Las Vegas and I'm telling you it was a total crashing bore other than every time Trump spoke. You you were you were just sleeping and then oh good, Trump is talking again. <laughs> there there you go. Well, we are just about out of time. Do you have a website address where people can go to get information about the book? And keep track of your activities. Yes, it's com, and I'm on Twitter. I'll be live twe- tweeting the debate tonight unless I get bored and fall asleep. Yes, you um, will. My Twitter, my you, Twitter nobody tweets more than you. I, I don't even, you must not sleep. Uh, actually, I don't have that many tweets, but I'm, but they have a lot of impact. <laughs> they, they certainly, they certainly do. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. But before we close the program today, I want to take a moment to thank you for making time to speak with us and to congratulate you on the success of your book. Thank you, Ms. Coulter. Thank you. It was great to be here. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much and uh, have fun tweeting tonight. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.